Okay, so uh, can some everyone confirm they can see the slide? A thumbs up or something? All right, great. Yeah. So the uh, my aim today is to give uh, some explanation of tools I've been thinking about um, to answer the question of how can we expand more? So uh, the context of the, oh, before I say that, everything here is work in progress. So this is certainly not publishable, but I really would like to stimulate discussion and hopefully put this together into a neat result that will give new tools in which we can control these kind of uh, uh, analog systems. Great. So what I want to begin with are the tools we have in the laboratory to engineer these systems. So this is going to be a very experimentally oriented talk, even though it comes out as a proposal. So we can manipulate potentials, particularly in a form of optical lattice potentials or traps. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, we can tune the interactions, and I'll be using that predominantly as a foil. So going closer or further from a Feshbach resonance to tune the interaction strength. And lastly, there's an additional tool which I haven't seen mentioned in this community, which is further engineering of dispersion relations and the kinetic energy term in general. And you might call this artificial gauge fields or spin orbit coupling. And in this talk, I'll be talking about how each of these three ways can be used to change the metric and thereby expand or contract or maybe create uh, analog black holes or whatever. And I'm also gonna to try to do the honest thing and tell you why each of these things has some pretty uh, serious Achilles heels associated with them. And hopefully we can come to something that works based on all this. So the big picture is that a couple of years ago, uh, Gretchen, Ted and myself did a really fun experiment where we uh, created an expanding ring shape BEC. And this row of pictures on the bottom is a pretty honest uh, rendition of what happened. A ring got from kind of small to slightly larger. And slightly larger might mean you know, three, five, seven times bigger, but the number of E foldings we have here is always certainly a couple, maybe one or two. So how can we have an analog to an expanding universe that actually expands a lot? And I'm willing to call a lot a factor of 100. Um, now that might not be satisfactory to the cosmologists amongst us, but it'd be a pretty dramatic difference from a factor of three to five. So that would be the sort of goal we'd like to achieve. Um, if we can do this, I think there's a lot of neat things, uh, neat experiments that we could do that are going well beyond the qualitative, uh, small scale things we saw in this original expanding universe thing. We saw hints of Hubble friction, and we could have equivalently seen uh, hints of anti-friction, so amplification or um, suppression of excited phonon-like modes. We saw nothing like particle creation and nothing like cooling. It would be nice to expand enough to see modifications pulled out or pushed into the quantum back background. And we didn't really see anything associated with the formation of horizon. So the fact that we briefly had causal disconnection in our system didn't give any kind of observable physics. And all of this could be realized more likely if we were able to expand the universe by significantly larger and probe the dynamics actually during that expansion rather than the subsequent evolution. So these are opportunities. I'd love to realize these opportunities. And what's the limiting factor? Rings are great, but why couldn't we just expand by more? Well, the practical issue is the atoms are trapped, sort of as I depict on the top left, in a ring that's caused to expand by changing the pattern of an optical field. And as you, if you expand it, but maintain the local intensity about the same where the atoms are, the total power that we need to create these trapping uh, potentials is increasing dramatically during time, to the extent that we can't actually do that with the lasers we have available to us. Um, that's problem one. Problem two is this system had a finite radial width and the transverse excitations in the expanding ring experiment were both interesting and important and in the end of the day largely irrelevant to any kind of cosmological implications. So this was an issue and without even tighter confinement it remains to be an issue. And then thirdly and something that perhaps we haven't highlighted enough, uh, the potential became lar uh, increasingly measurably non-uniform during the expansion. So the pictures on the bottom if you look at the far right, you'll see that the density as a function of the azimuthal variable is not uniform. And that non-uniformity has to do with slight imperfections in the projected trapping potential that at some point become pretty much unavoidable with this type of technology. Um, so as the density drops, you become more and more susceptible to that. So these are, this is just life with expanding rings. And it doesn't mean there aren't neat things to do with expanding rings, but it does mean that there's gonna be serious uh, hobbling issues if you try to expand or contract by a lot. All right, so with that, I want to give my sort of beginner's introduction to 
where this curved space time or expanding space time analogy is coming from. And this was kind of to benefit me more than anything else to make sure what I talk about subsequently is not going to be complete junk. And I'll be concluding with a real metric in a couple of slides, and this gets us halfway there. Also in the yellow box, you can see that I'm coming from a different community because to me, G means coupling constant in a GPE or a quantum field theory and not a metric. So I'm sorry, this is gonna be confusing. I didn't have time to remedy that problem, so apologies. So the basic schema here is nothing new. We're gonna start with the GPE. I'm not gonna worry about quantized fluctuations. And we're gonna do what to a, uh, a condensed matter person is a little bit of an unusual version of the linearizing approximation. So we're gonna do relative linearization where you have a background field uh, psi naught and you're gonna look at the relative fluctuations away from that rather than the absolute fluctuations. So it's a, it's a slightly different way of treating the problem. Um, doing this and going to a real and imaginary uh, variables ultimately leads to this sort of covariant type structure. And for the fluid models, this quantity we're calling F is really the more natural thing to think about rather than the tensors, we're gonna, uh, the metrics we'll have a little bit later. And what I've written down below is that quantity, and you'll see that it is, doesn't have anything to do with dimensionality or anything like that. This could be 1D, 2D, 3D. It all is going to work out perfectly well. So that's kind of natural. Uh, as a point of comparison, I found that the nicest place to learn this is a sort of set of analog gravity notes by Matt Visser that's, that's on, on the web and actually has been updated since the publication date. So it's a super nice place to uh, get a, a primer on this type of thing. All right. Great, so how can we do this? How could we possibly tune uh, that metric type quantity? Um, well, initial proposals either involved actually expanding the system, by, for example, by ballistic explosion, or later on by Feshbach tuning. And Feshbach tuning might seem a dream. So I got inspired to revisit uh, thinking about this after the really nice analog gravity meeting at the Royal Society this past winter, one of the last meetings I got to go to before the shutdown. And um, you might think that this is just a, Beautiful case. So I've listed lithium-7 as a dream boson. And what I'm plotting here is some amazing data from Randy Hewlett's group, where they were able to observationally scan the interaction strength by something like, uh, count them, those are not decades, those are two decades listed. So you're talking like eight orders of magnitude of scanning of the scattering length, which is absolutely astonishing. Um, there's two caveats you should take away from this before saying this, the uh, story is done. The first thing is sort of illustrated by much older data from the same group on the bottom, which is a loss rate. So you're losing a lot of atoms when you get to the very strongly repulsive region. So more or less above about a thousand uh, 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 gauss on that, or sorry, 700 gauss on that graph, the scattering rate's gonna become intolerable. So the upper four orders of magnitude are probably not really practically accessible. So more or less, if you extend the uh, line of this inset over, that's gonna give you the maximum scattering length you might practically achieve but there's lots of orders of magnitude left. So is our story done? And the answer is no, there's a second practical issue, um, which is implicit in the hydrodynamic description, but is often not made explicit when thinking about the regime of applicability of these things in trap systems. And that is, as you are tuning the scattering length down to simulate an expanding system, yes, the speed of light is changing, but the associated quantity, the healing length is also changing. And the healing length, this quantity on the far right, is a divergent quantity. And that healing length is really giving you the range of momenta over which the Lorentz uh, invariant description, in fact, applies. So if you were to do this idea and try to scan the scattering length very close to zero, you would discover that very quickly the healing length would become comparable or exceed the actual size of your system. So if you tried to tune the scattering length by a factor of four, um, in this case, would leading to cha a change in the metric by, four, by two orders of magnitude, you would discover that there would be only two case states that in fact are still within the Lorentz invariant approximation by the end of the scattering uh, scaling. And I th think that's probably an un unacceptable situation if you're trying to actually ex um, simulate the expansion of Lorentz invariant problem. So this is the problem I'd like to try to think about how to solve. How can we uh, so scan this parameter in the system while still having the system have many, many K modes that are still involved in the, the Lorentz invariant part of the description. Okay, that's statement of problem. So an alternate path um, that sort of I try to make clear in these two uh, equations, the speed of sound and the healing length, is not by scanning the uh, chemical potential or the interaction strength, but rather by scanning the uh, change of the mass. Okay. So can we tune the mass instead of tuning the interactions and at least have a different knob. And we'll see that, yes, there's a different knob, but it has its own limitations. All right, so now I wanna finish the story. 
Um, and these limitations will already begin uh, here. So if I want to recast my previous covariant expression in terms of a metric type expression, I'm just going to compel it to take on this form. And we'll find that, yes, we can do that. And these line elements are probably uh, the most informative thing. You'll see they depend on dimensionality, but not in a particularly important sort of way. And the scaling relation on the bottom, which tells you if you change either the interaction strength, the density, or the mass, um, that will change the uh, size of these length elements, involves either the coupling constant or the mass appearing in the same place. So if you want to simulate an expanding universe, you either drop the interaction strength or drop the mass. Either of these will work. Um, so it's the product that's going to come in. And for the moment, I'll assume that the, the density could be staying the same. All right, that's one way to think about it. I found this to be interesting, informative, and a little bit unnatural. So I want to uh, have a different way, which I'll call starting at the bottom. So imagine that we start either with our original quantum field theory, um, or we start with the Gross-Podesky equation. I'll just start with the GPE. What does it mean in the context of a GPE to have a expanding mass? Well, the easiest way to think about that is simply to change the variables in terms of the positional variables by some scaling function here. Um, that can be put down in the GPE like this. This has a subtle point, which I um, have not seen in the uh, relevant literature before that I want to make. If you change the positional variable and conserve the number of particles, you're going to have to be changing the norm of your GPE wave function, which norms to the total number of particles. So when you do this, there's this odd imaginary term that's appearing in your GPE that's enforcing the non-conservation of, uh, of the, it's changing the, the norm of this quantity so that you can have reduced densities. Okay, so there's a little, a little trick going on there. Um, anyway, otherwise when you do this, if you change the scaling factor to compensate out the mass, you'll see that here too in this description on the bottom, the altered interaction, the possibly changing interaction, now acquires a term right next to it, which is the fractional change in the mass. And here you see that the dimensionality also comes in there. And that has to do with the fact that if you're changing psi to keep the total, um, if you're changing the metric, the density has to drop, but to keep the energy the same, um, you're gonna have to be changing the interaction strength here. All right, so that is a just a completely different way that will lead to the same answers of thinking about this. And now let's go investigate how we can practically do so. Oh, sorry. I wanted to give uh, a, a bit of background, so I didn't know my next slide. Um, so here's an, just an example of a, uh, the type of mode freezing you might see from quite an old paper uh, from Willie Fisher quite a while ago, imagining scanning the spin dependent interaction strength in a BEC. So if you could do this, you might see some neat mode freezing effect. And looking through the literature, the closest thing I can come to to a relevant experiment is something uh, pretty fun from Chen Chin's group. And what they did here is quench the interaction strength from large to small and look at the excitations that were created. And you can think about this about going from one quantum vacuum to another quantum vacuum. But what they did not look at in this experiment is, that if, is the actual dynamics during the quench behavior there, which would be the aim of an inflation experiment. And also this has all the limitations of tuning the interactions. Notwithstanding, this is a really neat experiment of, of its own right. All right, relevant to later on in this program, I'm going to assume that transverse degrees of freedom are bad, meaning that the radial degrees of freedom in the ring or any kind of degrees of freedom that are not looking at the dynamics up are bad. They make life confusing and they make the, reduce the applicability of the analog simulation problem. So I will always assume strong transverse confinement. But always willing to make a lemonade out of lemons, you should wait for Ted Jacobs' talk a little later on, where they, uh, Ted Asid is gonna give a talk that transverse degrees of freedom are good. They introduce new physics and are interesting to study. So I'm not really saying they're bad, I'm gonna say I will ignore them. Alrighty, so if you wanna change the mass of something, change the effective mass, I think that the uh, elephant in the room clearly is gonna, are gonna be optical lattices. So we'll imagine perhaps a two-dimensional optical lattice as I've depicted here, I've schematically illustrated the band structure here. And if you have a low density system sitting at the, near the minimum of this band structure, uh, the effective mass is clearly gonna get large if you increase the lattice step or decrease if you decrease the lattice step. And here's a plot showing the nearly exponential dependence of the tunneling parameter and therefore the effective mass upon the depth of the lattice. So here we have, you know, maybe two orders of magnitude of scanning for reasonable parameters, uh, giving a, a decent dynamic range to tune the effective mass. That's fantastic, and this is a great time to introduce relevant experimental variable uh, dimensions. So I'll be talking about energy and units of the single photon recoil, 
and momentum and the single photon momentum. So that's the amount of momentum or energy a atom at rest gets if it scatters one of the photons that make up this optical lattice. And these are conveniently uh, have the right units for a, a cold atom system, a couple of kilohertz or a couple of hundreds of nanokelvins. Great. Unfortunately, uh, we have co quickly come to realize this is described by the Bose-Hubbard model as depicted here, and scanning the tunneling will also drive the very interesting physics between the superfluid to insulating behavior. So the presence of these MOT lobes very quickly limits the ability to dynamically change the tunneling by very much. So on this graph, if you start at the very tip of one of these lobes, let's say here, and scan the tunneling downwards to give the same change in the effective mass, you'll see perhaps you have one order of magnitude the tunneling you can do. All the while, this is going from a very strongly correlated quantum fluid to a more weakly correlated quantum fluid, changing the range of applicability of the hydrodynamic description by more than one might want. But still, this is a, a knob we have to give some, some scaling. So what I'd like to think about now is a completely different way of doing this that doesn't suffer from the same deficiencies, and that is to do spin orbit coupling. Here we have a pair of counter-propagating lasers that alter the dispersion of a cold atom system in a different way, coupling together the, the internal spin states. And because this is sort of a concept talk, I don't want to get too much into this, but you have two internal states of the atoms, and if you start at rest in one of the internal states, and exchange a photon flip, flip into the other state, the atom will then acquire momentum and be moving. We can visualize this in terms of a pair of displaced parabola that represent the uncoupled momenta of these systems that then are coupled by the optical field, initially as a function of the crystal momentum on the horizontal axis, opening a gap in the dispersion relation spectrum of the system. And as this laser coupling increases and the gap becomes larger, this dispersion relation near the origin goes from being concave down to concave up, allowing us a new way to alter the dispersion of the system. And you can see going from very, very heavy down here to heavier and heavier. And if you go the opposite direction, the mass will return to the bare mass. So we have a, a, a different mechanism to tune the atomic mass. Um, this works in the laboratory. Here are some measurements of these minima and the tuning. And if you plug in the numbers, you're gonna say, wow, this is gonna be another amazing way. The speed of sound can be tuned by a couple of orders of magnitude by scanning from very, very close to the critical point where these minima merge together and the effective mass diverges back to something that looks like the speed of sound in the original case. All the while, the, core, the healing length is staying virtually unchanged. Wow, isn't that amazing? Turns out this has an Achilles heel as well. If you look at the dispersion relation, yes, the effective mass is in fact diverging. At the divergent point, the, the dispersion relation is in fact quartic. And if one computes the Bogolyubov spectrum for a quartic dispersion relation, you'll discover quite amazingly that the Bogolyubov spectrum is entirely quadratic in that regime. So again, although the, the, uh, the healing length is still large, the Bogolyubov spectrum still has transitioned from a linear dispersion here to a quadratic dispersion there. And the range of the Lorentz approximation, again, has gone to zero momentum. So this technique also has an Achilles heel. Um, I, was, I want to just uh, quickly say, although there's an Achilles heel here, I think it's worth thinking about. And we can extend this to two dimensions. Um, in two dimensions, some other laser coupling scheme gives a two dimension dispersion whose lowest band structure looks like this. This has a second problem that I wanted to illustrate to uh, guide our thinking on this problem, which is the dispersion relation is no longer uh, symmetric at all. So now the speed of sound along different directions is changing in different rates. So whilst there is a range of Lorentz approximation, your space is no longer isotropic, which could be interesting, but it's um, another challenge to think about. So at the end of my talk, I want to think about optical lattices, sort of a new hope version. And that new hope is to recognize that in this phase diagram I previously showed, the effective mass and the interactions can be simultaneously tuned. So provided you don't tune them exactly in tandem at fixed ratio, which would leave you at a fixed point in this diagram, you have the ability to walk through this diagram in different ways by simultaneously tuning the scattering length, which does work well both on lithium and potassium, and also changing the lattice depth, which works well in both of those atoms as well. So I think thinking about this type of simultaneous tuning is a neat option. And in putting together this talk, I wanted to throw out something, oh, uh, just as a neat tool we have without any particular talking points to go to it, which is that all of this can be made spatially dependent. 
So the effective mass by changing the locally changing the depth of a lattice or the coupling of a Raman coupled system can lead to position dependent effective masses. And the new tool of optical Feshbach resonances can lead to position dependent effective interactions. Both of these are rather like changing the depth of the water in a water analog gra uh, gravity system, giving inhomogeneous speeds of sound and changing the metric in that kind of way. And I want to sort of give a, a quick reference that I thought was quite nice in trying to understand the basics of water waves and the connection to analog gravity and sort of a, a self-fortuitous reference to tuning Feshbach uh, positions with optical, with uh, laser fields. And with this, I'd like to conclude here as a current JQI team thinking about um, atom circuits and expanding rings, both um, and simulating expanding universes in this way, both experimentally and theoretically. And uh, recently, uh, Steve Eckel, who was a lead author in the expanding our lead postdoc in the expanding ring experiment has started collaborating theoretically with Ted Jacobson on these uh, limitations because of finite trans with, transverse width. And with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ian. So it's time to take, thank you for staying in time. So it's now question time. Any questions? No questions. While I'm wait, while we're waiting for ah, Zach, wonderful. Uh, please Hi, go sorry. ahead. Um, we've been looking at a similar system where we're uh, tuning the interface wave speed using either a straw magnet or uh, an oscillating, a vertical oscillator. And I was wondering if you have any idea about what kind of spatial inhomogeneities. Um, might cause what kind of effects? Uh, so what kind of inhomogeneities have you looked at? And what kind of signatures of these homogeneities might you find in said systems? Okay, so I'm gonna answer that question uh, from the perspective of the literal atomic physics interpretation. And just to say that my, as a newcomer in this analog gravity field and never a practitioner of, of general relativity, I'm relatively weak in making good transitions between them. So I hope someone who's more strong could do that uh, better than myself. So that answered, imagine, uh, with that caveat, imagine that what we're tuning uh, is the effective mass in the system. So you take a, a lattice potential, and in the center of the system, you deform it so the mass is larger. In these cold atom systems, we can do things very similar to what can be done in a tank of water, which means you can modulate one wall of a, a box uh, trap system and launch phonons that would propagate across the system. And what you discover in the center of such a system is that the speed of sound would indeed, indeed drop in the region of larger effective mass, creating a lensing-like phenomena. So you can think about that as a variant index of refraction or whatever you want, but these type of inhomogeneities will lead to local variations in the speed of sound that would manifest themselves with lens-like phenomena that can be observed in, such a in a manner such as that. Um, so that, that's the way I've been thinking about this so far. And I would love to be educated in terms of the right way to think about this uh, in terms of the, the, the metric description. Me too. Uh, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, as, as a host, I cannot uh, raise my hand, but I, I still have a question. Yes, please go ahead. So uh, there were two uh, points where you um, you said uh, when you expand, you get these uh, inhomogeneities, and then there's also the renormalization of the of the wave function, and you you kind of consider them as very technical points. But isn't this just artifact of a more sort of profound thing that when you expand your space, inhomogeneities uh, grow? And, and, and the same about when you expand your space, your, your particle number doesn't need to be conserved? Uh, yeah, so the, I, I think I'd answer those two questions uh, separately. So the first one, when we're expanding this trapping potential, uh, the one I've, I've pictured here, it, it really is a technical thing that the, the laser field has, uh, if you think about the red sheet here, for example, as, as sort of a cartoon, that, that laser field is inhomogeneous. And we certainly have the capability 
of adding additional potentials vertically to compensate this, those inhomogeneities. But that becomes super tricky if you're also simultaneously expanding the ring. So the inhomogeneities you see here really are coming from laboratory imperfections that with sufficient experimental control could be compensated for. Um, in contrast, um, the, the, uh, this imaginary term in the GPE that appears here, that one, yes, is an, entire, is a, it's an interesting result of changing the coordinate frame in, in this way that, a lot, that compels the density to be dropped locally by changing the norm. So this is an intrinsic and interesting effect that comes in with this kind of formulation. And obviously it's related in the sense that the density drops leading to an increased sensitivity to external perturbations. But in a situation where we tune the effective mass, the atoms aren't actually in the lab frame moving. And that would open the door for better potential compensation. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one quick last question. Uh, David, please. Uh, thank you, Silke. So, Ian, uh, I just want to comment about the the fact that you like uh, you have this dispersion that it's not linear anymore, and I think you shouldn't uh, like you shouldn't be that much that worried about it. The, um, well, in optics, usually these dispersions are highly nonlinear, and we we can still do a lot of uh, like uh, like analog effects, and I think you should try to see it the positive side. Like, what different things can you see in like this uh, dispersive uh, dispersive uh, uh, regime? Yeah. So uh, to to avoid excessive negativity and, and to appreciate that point, um, one thing that is important to keep in mind it relates to this healing length factor I was mentioning. So here, through all the all these dispersions, the um, Although this is quadratic, for all of these places, hopefully you can see my cursor, let's say the momentum may be minus 0.7 all the way to zero, the Bogolubov quasi-particles are extremely different than, than free atoms there. So you still have to solve this problem in a Bogolubov description. And you'll find out that physics such as the creation of particle-antiparticle pairs, if you were to quench from strong to weak or weak to strong, would be uh, valid over a wide range of, uh, of momenta. It's simply that the, they would not be if you were at this uh, quartic point, the dispersion of these quasi-particles no longer is linear. So some physics, um, I should have, I maybe I took too negative of a tact here, uh, but I wanted to be very clear about the, the, not to oversell anything. So in that list of things I thought was interesting, creating particles out of vacuum would work. So if you started on, on the red curve here with the quadratic dispersion and then quench towards linear, you would end up create, uh, this would be going towards the expanding universe direction you in fact would be creating the same kind of quasi-particles you would have anyway had this a linear dispersion because that has to do with the superpositions you have in the, uh, the Bogubov matrix and not the dispersion they had. So, yeah. Yeah, but it still, it still limits the number of e-folds you can get because you have a static term, which is basically the quantum pressure that's not changing. And having this in the system is strongly limiting how, my, how many e-folds, how much change you can have. So one way we are getting around that in a two fluid system is by, I think, I mean, one way to get around that is by looking exactly at multi-component multi systems, which gives you more knobs to tune. Yeah. You have to get rid of this uh, dispersive effects either way. I think or reduce them strongly. Uh, I think we're running out of time, but I'm sure Ian is happy to, to take more questions uh, in a private setting.